10 minutes and be back. My, my dinner is on the table of bad timing on my part. My apologies. But I will rejoin when uh, um, a bit later. OK, well, I'll give uh, uh, Angela our regards. I shall and to Gloria as well. And uh, 1903, um, I'm just tempted to uh, say, Rob, welcome. Um, and um, tonight's meeting is we're not number eight today, or is it number nine? Or is it's it it's number number eight. Number yeah. nine is uh, June the first, which is the, the last one for the season uh, until we pick up. No, it's in not. September. No, it's oh, not. We, oh, we've got. I'm, uh, one on the first and one on the fifteenth, I believe. Well, I'm just standing corrected again here. How many more mistakes can I make in a night? Well, that's not that's not push that because I know I can. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Rob's well known. Um, you're a student, so um, and I know Rob as well. I think I'll just uh, hand it over to you. So go for it. Okay. We might as well. Uh, we might as well go for it. Yes. Uh, presenting technical evidence in court for today. Um, and for the next time around, um, BSS 9 at that point, June the 1st, um, we will be doing NFTs and Bitcoin and digital cash and blockchains. Oh my. Um, and various other and sundry things. Uh, in regard to that. So, uh, this is subtitled CSI Yale Town is not going to help um, because, well, I'll, I'll get more into uh, why CSI Yale Town is not going to help as, as we get into it, but uh, CSI has an awful lot to, uh, to pay for. So, uh, again, this is presenting evidence in court. Um, it deals with uh, legal stuff. So I should uh, indicate that no, I am not a lawyer. This is not legal advice um, and and all those other uh, great disclaimer type things. Um, and uh, another point about presenting evidence in court is I'm sorry, this is not going to be uh, simply a checklist of of how you're going to do it we're we're going to have to uh go through th through some principles here and you're going to have to apply it to your particular situation but hopefully it gives you a bit of an idea of uh how to comport yourself in court and and in particular how to prepare um and definitely how to deal with lawyers um, but uh, this isn't uh, a quick uh, how to. Uh, so we'll get right into the uh, basic legal symptom systems. And, and uh, Chris, you're going to see this again uh, on uh, Friday. Uh, the uh, legal systems and the difference between different legal systems. Um, we uh, here in Canada, anyways, operate under a common law legal system. And unfortunately, common law is not all that common. There's only, I believe, 42 countries in the world that have or operate under common law legal systems. And some of them, for example, the United States, um, that's not entirely true. Uh, of the states in the United States, two of them, Louisiana and California, operate under code or civil law legal systems. Um, there are a number of differences. And in, in a common law legal systems, um, the, the law is uh, uh, based on a, a charter document. Oh, we have another person who wants to enter the lobby. So um, let's... Uh, admit that person and why is it that uh, uh, okay let's save that uh, and we'll admit this person to our meeting 
Uh, and while he gets in there, we'll go back to presenting technical evidence in court. No, he's he's still being admitted. Anyways, uh, common law uh, legal system um, gives us a uh, uh, why why is okay. Sorry, this is just obviously uh, okay. Admit admitting. Okay, hopefully he's going to show up. Back we go. Okay, common law. Um, there's a charter document in uh, the UK that is the uh, uh, the Magna Carta. Uh, here in Canada, it's the Bill of Rights. In the United States, uh, they have the Constitution. And laws, even if they are passed by the legislatures in the com countries, uh, may be challenged in the courts as to whether they uh, breach the charter documents, it, it, whether they are in conflict with those principles. And common law does set up legal principles and legal precedents. It has a number of them. And we tend to think that everything in common law, because of course this is what we see on TV uh, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, the laws, the, the operation of the courts, we tend to think that it, it applies universally and mostly it doesn't. Uh, under the common law legal system, there is the uh, presumption of innocence that you are presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. Um, that doesn't hold universally. Um, we have uh, jury trials. Again, that does not hold universally. And again, under common law legal systems, if uh, there is not a specific law, there are uh, legal principles that apply. For example, if I am uh, uh, when when computer trespass started, when people started breaking into computers, uh, nobody had laws against that because nobody had laws about computers. Uh, but in in the common law list, uh, system, we have laws of mischief and trespass and and that sort of thing, which then could be applied to the computer situation. Uh, if the courts agreed. Uh, under civil or code law legal systems, if you don't have a law against it, it's not against the law. It's not a crime. And if uh, we have, uh, for example, a, uh, well, uh, the, the love bug uh, virus as, as an example, um, that they uh, they knew who had done it. Um, it was you know basically proven. Uh, there was no uh, contradicting the the evidence. You know uh, it was all uh, pretty cut and dried. But when um, they actually brought the case to trial, they found they couldn't. Uh, you know. They, Everybody showed up in court and, and they said, you know, this is uh, what we need to do. And, uh, you know, here here's our evidence and so on and so forth. And the, and the judge said, wait a minute, what law are you charging him with? And they did not have a law in Manila, which is under a, a civil or code law legal system um, that addressed that particular crime. And so it wasn't a crime. Uh, so, you know, so those are some of the differences in, in the common law versus the code law legal systems. And there are also uh, religious legal systems in some situations. There are traditional uh, legal systems in, in some situations. Most of those eventually, uh, religious and, and uh, traditional legal law uh, systems, tend to devolve into uh, civil or code law. But as I say, common law is rather uncommon. 
all of this becomes important because in dealing with computer crimes, very often the issue of jurisdiction becomes fairly complex. And so is this a crime where the victim is? Is this a crime where the perpetrator is? And is this a crime where the server happens to be placed? Um, you know, and where does the crime take place within cyberspace? So uh, jurisdictional issues can become very complex and the legal systems in the various jurisdictions can come into play. And even if you are charging somebody under a common law legal system, uh, uh, trying to uh, arrange for extradition or, or even uh, evidence collection uh, under other legal systems may present uh, some legal problems in, in terms of the jurisdiction uh, that will apply there. So under under a common law legal system at the very least and, and usually under a civil law legal system, uh, there is first of all criminal law. Uh, something has to be a crime. Uh, in Canada, it's really simple. We have the Criminal Code of Canada. That's it. If it's in the Criminal Code, it's it's a crime. If it's not, it's not. Um, that's the be all and end all. The United States is is uh, much more complex, and and of course, I have to teach, you know, American law to Americans very often, and the. Uh, the United States doesn't have a legal system. It has, as far as I can know, about 75, maybe more legal systems. Each state has its own. Federally, they have a separate one. Uh, the DC, in fact, has its own uh, legal system. Uh, the military has a, a number of legal systems. Some of the uh, First Nations have their own, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there are a number of legal systems there. and. Each state, for example, you know, the federal government passes laws, each state passes laws. So there are different crimes at different places in the United States. You know, talk about jurisdictional issues. Uh, so criminal law can get complex in a place like the United States. Then there's civil or tort law. And don't confuse the civil or code law legal system with civil or tort law, which may well apply under a common law legal system or other thing. This is, um, well, a tort basically means harm or injury. Uh, somebody has done something that hurts you. Now, that is not necessarily criminal you know, it's criminal if they come and punch you in the nose, but if they have done something that cost you money or something, that is not necessarily a crime, but you can take them to civil court uh, and launch a lawsuit, a tort. And uh, that uh, does not allow you to put them in jail if the decision goes in your favor and against them. But it does allow you to get uh, redress in terms of money, that they owe you some money because they have done some injury to you. Um, intellectual property uh, generally falls under this. So the copyright, patent, trademark, trade secret issues uh, all will, will be intellectual property, all will fall under uh, civil law. Uh, or tort law, lawsuits, and that sort of thing. Then there is administrative law, and administrative law, or uh, regulatory law, as it's uh, sometimes called, that uh, tends to refer to specific um, industries. So uh, banking is going to have a, a great deal of regulation. Uh, uh, medical fields are going to have regulations. Uh, so there is going to be a, a fair amount of administrative law in regard to those uh, uh, areas and, and uh, those types of activity. And uh, that administrative or regulatory law will apply to those people in, involved in, in that field of endeavor, but not to the public as a whole. 
Uh, as I said, jurisdiction um, can be really complex. Um, casinos, it's, uh, I mean, aside from Atlantic City and, and Las Vegas and um, uh, basically any uh, Indian band in uh, the United States, um, there are severe restrictions about who can run a casino and how. Um, and uh, actually, it's not illegal to run a casino. It's illegal to have Americans uh, as your uh, uh, guests, clients, whatever, in, in the casino. Um, it's illegal to provide gambling uh, facilities to Americans but it's it's not illegal to run a casino. It's kind of a bizarre situation. Um, so uh, online casinos are not illegal. It's just illegal for them to have American uh, customers gambling in the casinos, in the online casinos. So I, I know that there is a um, uh, was a situation. Um, the uh, Online casino, of course, was operating mostly in the United States, mostly with American customers. The company was registered in the Cayman Islands. The servers running the casino were in the basement of a hotel here in Burnaby. So, uh, you know, where's the the jurisdiction for that? Who, who do you sue? Where do you sue? Uh, what laws uh, apply? in in that particular case um the uh what are they called the uh the dc snipers um because uh washington dc is is sort of enclosed within uh maryland but part you know touching on virginia and and there, you know there's a number of states very close by um it was, it's very easy to transfer jurisdictions in there, and then there, you know, there's the federal government involved as well. Five different jurisdictions had a, a big fight over who was going to uh, bring these guys to trial when they finally caught them. And I mean, you know, there was no question about, you know, how guilty they were or anything like that. It was just, you know, uh, sort of a turf war as to who, who got to charge them first. Uh, so interesting uh, issues of, of jurisdiction. Uh, now, uh, as I said, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a techie. I'm a geek. Um, the you're going to be dealing with lawyers. If you're going to you know present evidence in court, you're going to be dealing with lawyers. And lawyers are not just you know working in a different field than we do. They are a different species than we are. Um, we, you know, in, in technology, code works or it doesn't. Uh, the background and documentation of what is done in, in regard to uh, code programs, uh, systems, um, that's irrelevant. As a matter of fact, we tend to think documentation is irrelevant anyways, and so we don't write it when we write programs, which is probably a, a problem. But in in law, um, well, if you ask a lawyer anything, doesn't matter what question you ask, the answer is going to be it depends. And there's, you know, they can look at it from this direction, they can look at it from that direction. Um, the standard joke uh, that they tell all new lawyers is um, if the law is against you, argue the facts. If the facts are against you, argue the law. If the facts and the law are against you, raise your voice. And one of the other jokes is um, being in court is not about who is right or who is wrong. That's irrelevant. Being in court is 12 people deciding who has the most entertaining lawyer. So, uh, lawyers will definitely look at things from a completely different perspective than we have. You know, it's it's not binary to them. It's um, 
it's not it works or it doesn't. Um, uh, legal preparation is complex. Um, there's a lot of preparation. There's a lot of background. There's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of studying of the law. Um, if you have to be involved in a court case, and if particularly if you're going to be presenting evidence in court, make sure that you see it from the lawyer's perspective. Um, they it, it'll save you a lot of grief to do it that way. Do not fight them on this. This is their turf. And, you know, everything that we do in terms of uh, making sure that we are right, that we are correct, um, that tends to be irrelevant in their world. And also remember that it's, you know, it's not a system of it works or it doesn't or it's right or it's wrong. Uh, there is an adversarial world where there is somebody else in court and their only job is not to prove you're wrong, not to prove that you have made a mistake, not to refute your arguments. Their purpose, and really their only purpose, is to make you look bad. If they can make you look bad, they've won. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, book and, and movie uh, called Thank You for Smoking. Um, I, I highly recommend both. Uh, they are both good in, in different ways. But particularly in the movie, the um, lead character is, is teaching his son how to debate, essentially. And uh, at one point, the... Uh, He's teaching a lesson and, and the kid says, but that doesn't prove you're right. And he said, no, I don't have to be right. I just you know, have to present myself. Well, um, I uh, I gave a, a version of this talk uh, a number of years ago in. Uh, in Illinois, and uh, just before I went in, there were a group of people and it was obvious they were law enforcement. And uh, so I, I introduced myself, I, I said, um, I, uh, I assume you, you guys are gonna, you're in law enforcement, you're gonna be coming to my talk. And they said, yes. I said, uh, I'm gonna be calling on you to uh, uh, somebody in your group to answer a question. So you guys choose your champion uh, because this is gonna be a hard one. And so um, I, I did this on a fairly regular basis. Um, and I said, uh, uh, when I got to the, the right point in the presentation, I, uh, so, you know, you guys, who's your champion? And they all pointed at one guy. And I said, uh, fine, here's the question. You, we're in court. You are the expert witness on the stand. He said, okay. I said, now, uh, you have done the uh, uh, computer forensics on this particular computer. He said, yes, okay. I said, you uh, took a uh, uh, a bit image uh, copy of this machine. And he said, yes. I said, you uh, made sure that you included the Slack space. He said, yes. I said, uh, so did you include both the physical and the logical Slack space? And he said a little bit more slowly, yes. And I said, OK, which commercial software did you use in order to uh, get that. Um, and he stopped and didn't answer. And I said, fine, that's that's the right answer at this point, because of course there is no, uh, no software, no commercial software that will give you both the uh, physical and the logical Slack space. And, uh, you know, so basically I had made him look foolish. Uh, and that's all I, that I would need to do in court. Now, that's a trick question because, uh, uh, there, the, as I say, there there is no commercial product that will recover uh, both logical and physical slack space on uh, a, a hard drive from a computer. Um, and the only reason that I know this is because of the research that I did as a malware researcher many, many years ago. Um, the uh, forensics people, even specialty forensics people, 
do not know this because it's not something they encounter all the time. And, uh, you know, just to, to prove that, you know, any idiot can make somebody else look foolish in court, um, after we uh, came out of the presentation, uh, I talked to the guy and said thanks, and he handed me his business card. He was the director for the FBI's forensics lab for the Midwest. You know, so that's who I made look foolish, supposedly in court. Um, it's, you know, uh, it's going to be difficult to do this. So uh, on we go. Uh, some additional concepts that you're going to have to need to keep in mind. Liability. Um, you don't, uh, well, you are responsible. You have certain responsibilities, um, particularly if you're involved in any kind of transaction with somebody. Uh, and if you don't fulfill your responsibilities, then you are liable. Of course, you know, this, this is in terms of lawsuits and that sort of thing. But sometimes you can be criminally liable. Um, and it's not necessarily something that you do wrong that leads to liability. Sometimes it's something you should have done and didn't do. And if there was something you should have done and didn't do, then this is negligence. And again, sometimes there is criminal negligence. So do uh, care is the uh, the sort of standard. Did you take due care when when you were doing something or or uh, in a transaction or you know uh, failed to do something? You know, did you take due care? Now, there's due care and due diligence. Uh, in uh, legal dictionaries, uh, fairly often you will not uh, see a difference in the definitions of due care and due diligence. Sometimes they will even define them as each other. Uh, but um, if there is a difference, it, it tends to uh, uh, fall out that due care is what you did. Due diligence is how you proved what you did. So due diligence tends very slightly to be more about documentation than, than your actual actions. Uh, Encryption is a major fight, um, and this isn't necessarily uh, specifically about uh, uh, presenting uh, stuff in court, but you know this is a legal battle that um, we tend to have this fight with with law enforcement. Um, uh, they uh, uh, had a major push in the '90s, uh, trying. Uh, to make the point that they needed to have access to any kinds of communications. And so uh, any encryption had to be weak enough for them to be able to break it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that uh, kind of argument is, is currently being made. And unfortunately, um, there is no way, uh, well, sorry, encryption is vitally important to all of our security these days. We just rely on encryption everywhere. Uh, certainly in terms of online commerce. Um, this meeting, you know, the, the communications here is encrypted. Yeah. Uh, but any kind of transaction, if you buy a pizza online, you know, uh, um, your credit card uh, information when you enter it is, you know, is encrypted. And anything that weakens that uh, opens uh, people to attack. And there isn't any way to weaken uh, encryption in general and uh, still allow, you know, security to go ahead. So anytime law enforcement says, you know, we, we need to weaken encryption, um, they're basically these days saying um, we need to weaken security for everybody. It's very interesting. Um, China uh has decided uh you know to to go with weak encryption and it's very interesting uh because of the decisions by the chinese communist party because they are you know uh 
definitely mandating that we need access to everything for surveillance purposes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that um, this means that uh, basically uh, Chinese commercial systems are all pretty weak. And in fact, um, many uh, Chinese uh, companies uh, may be open to surveillance uh, from abroad, industrial espionage, spying, that sort of thing, because they do not have the ability to protect themselves in the same way with strong encryption or with security that is supported by strong encryption. So uh, it, it uh, in fact extends uh, as far as um, uh, government and, and military uh, people. I mean, certainly uh, government and military uh, uh, officers at the highest rank, um, they receive military grade encryption. They are going to be protected, but the run of the mill uh, political and military functionaries um, using the uh, fairly weak tools that are available to them within China um, are themselves open, open to espionage and spying. So it's it's rather an interesting uh, decision that has been been made in that regard. So, um, do we need to uh, to take a break here? I can uh, see that's nobody speaking. <laughs> nobody. <laughs> Everybody's listening intensely. Okay. It's interesting there about the U.S. saying you can't gamble if you're an American. I remember, actually, it was on Jeopardy. Uh, apparently, if you're a citizen of Monaco, you cannot gamble in Monaco. Ah. It was on Jeopardy, so it must be true. <laughs> well, they oh, had back yeah. All right. Um, five minute break. Okay. Can we get, can we cue the Jeopardy music? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll, yeah. Well, I was doing, just wondering if if we could get the rest of my students to to introduce themselves. Ah, that's a good idea. Go ahead and hit unmute all, see what happens. Go ahead, Chris, you, you've already uh, introduced yourself. You might as well do it again. No problem. Hi, I'm Chris and I've seen um, many, many classmates here. Um, nice to meet you all. I come from Hong Kong. I am a student at NYIT studying cybersecurity. Very cool. Okay. And Gildazio, you want to jump in there? Hi, Hobby. Uh, hi, folks. My name is Gildaz. I'm from Brazil. I just finished my master in NYIT and I'm doing some. Uh, Training with hobby, EISSP. And Taiji? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Um, my name is Taiji Ogawa, the student of the NOIT. I just completed my, uh, my course. Um, yeah. So yeah, I have a, a telecommunication background, and then I'm really interested in the CISSP to you know, yeah, improve myself, and then therefore you know, my future career. So yeah, but this is a little bit different, right? Sorry, uh, the, the, the my computer has a problem, so I couldn't you know the attend the, the past five minutes. So yeah, I just missed something. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Well, you might might as well chat amongst yourselves. I'll I'll be uh, right back in a minute or so. Thank you, Rob.
And thank you everybody else for showing up uh, and attending these sessions. They are pretty cool. Um, it's nice to see people from around the world uh, join in and learn a little bit from uh, the sessions that we have. Hi, yeah. great to see everybody here. It's nice. Uh, thanks, uh, Rob, you know, and James. Uh, anytime. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Now's when we need the long list of dad jokes. Burn, burn. Looking for I thought, dad I jokes from I, me, are you? I, I thought I could goat you on with that one. <laughs> hi, Burn. Hello, hey, Commander. Hi, hi, how are you doing? Not too bad. Uh, Angela and I were looking, trying to figure out what kind of welcome mat to put on the uh, front door of her new house. Oh, <laughs> so, so I think moved? we I think we have one. It's uh, no. Have you moved? Not yet. No. Well, it's actually uh, it's a month tomorrow. Oh, okay. We uh, we take possession. Oh, happy move then. Happy Thank move. you. So <laughs> I think we've come across the one we we have a, a one of the Monty Python themes. So it'll be go away or I shall taunt you a second time. Great. Instead, instead of welcome. Oh, great. <laughs> great. Hi. And how is James going, James? I'm uh, happy I'm enjoying the uh, last of the sunshine. Doing well, really. Great. Hey. And yourself? Oh, I'm still living, you know, uh, under this train. Yeah, well, it'll all be over soon. <laughs> you you <laughs> hope so, huh? <laughs> One way or another. Yeah. We'll move on to the next chapter. Yeah. Okay, oh, okay. Uh, seeing as how not many people were uh, actually on deck when we started off here, um, uh, here with again, that's uh, the next uh, meeting, uh, June the 1st. Um, we're going to be dealing with NFTs and digital cash and Bitcoin and blockchains. Oh my. Uh, so just uh, uh, some uh, upcoming events. But back to this. As, as I say, the uh, my students are going to uh, basically see uh, a good deal of this again on on Friday. Um, but uh, that's OK, so you get a, a little bit of a preview, uh, although we're going to be dealing with more stuff in investigation and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so types of evidence. Um, now, direct evidence is considered the best evidence. Uh, we'll come to uh, rules of evidence and you always have to use the best evidence that's available to you. Direct evidence is a witness statement and that's considered the best, the most reliable uh, uh, evidence, which is really bizarre in terms of the uh, psychological studies that we have done uh, in recent years, definitely uh, proving that witnesses are terrible witnesses. Uh, witnesses forget things, uh, witnesses get confused, witnesses um, uh, change their stories and, and even change their memories. Uh, apparently some of the recent studies that we've uh, seen indicate that um, when you tell something that you remember, you're not actually remembering it, you're recreating it. And so when you are uh, interviewing and, and everything it involved in investigation um, it has you know specialty areas in it and certainly interviewing 
and interrogation is definitely one of the specialty areas because it's it's very easy to lead a witness and and that is illegal um not to mention being even you know outside of court when you are interviewing someone just in terms of investigation just in terms of gathering facts um it's really incredibly easy to get people to remember things that never happened and i'm not even talking anything as drastic as false memory syndromes but um if you if you set up a little play uh just you know people interacting and and uh, talking back and forth and moving between each other um and ask witnesses to uh then recount what happened it's it's you know very easy to get them to remember things that didn't happen uh you you ask them okay you know uh, you remember what what happened here and and who talked to who and and yes and they start uh, talking about things, and you say, what about the guy in the red hat? Uh, what guy in the red hat? Oh, you remember the guy in red hat? He had a he had a yellow vest on, and he had a green tie. And pretty soon, uh, yes, they remember the guy in the red hat, and they can uh, give you details about him, and and whether or not he was clean shaven, or or had uh, facial hair and and you know tall or short or big or small and there never was any guy in a red hat um you know but but when you indicate that you all you have to do to lead a witness is when they say something you know lean forward widen your eyes as if you were interested and they will try and recall more details. And if they can't recall more details, they will make them up. So it's it's incredibly easy to lead witnesses. And it's incredibly important to when you're doing an accurate, proper investigation to make sure that you don't. So that's, uh, you know, it, interesting things about witness statements. Now, real evidence that's a tangible object you know blood blood spatter dna a smoking gun a bloody knife uh you know that's real evidence that's a tangible object we don't deal with real evidence and you say of course we do we deal with computers well yes computers are real but it's not the computer that's important the computer is irrelevant and relevance is something that we will have to uh, deal with in terms of, of evidence. Uh, what we deal with is information, and information is intangible. This is not anything real. It is a magnetic field on a hard disk, a tiny microscopic, uh, well, not even microscopic. It's smaller than that. You need an electron microscope to see the magnetic fields. Um, so this is this is information. This is is documentary evidence. This is where we sit. And documentary evidence um, very often is is not particularly real. Um, uh, and and we'll get to that in a second. Um, then there's demonstrative evidence, and this is this is CSI. And uh, I mean, you've all seen this on, on television. You've got the court cases and the guy brings, you know, trundles the monitor into court. And there's this wonderful animation that clearly demonstrates that uh, what happened happened and it had to have happened this way and so on and so forth. It's incredibly expensive to prepare those kinds of, of demonstrations. And uh, but people expect it, you know, they've seen CSI on, on TV that that's what they expect it to do. You know, every court case should involve this stuff and it should be able to be presented within 45 minutes, excluding commercial breaks. It's just not real. Um, and, you know, the CSI shows have an awful lot to answer for. So documentary evidence by and large is hearsay. Now what hearsay is, is um, when you're giving direct 
evidence, uh, a witness statement, you can say, I saw this, I did this, I, uh, you know, uh, my, my direct evidence. Uh, you can even say, I, I heard this, but what you can't say is, is, I heard Billy say that he heard so-and-so say, you know, that's hearsay, that's um, not direct evidence. You know, if, if we wanted to hear what Billy said, we will ask Billy what, what Billy said. Um, so, documentary evidence is uh, very often related to business records, and business records are not considered direct evidence of a transaction. They are evidence around a transaction. They are, in a sense, hearsay. And therefore, we have to have backup testimony proving that we should trust this documentary evidence. Um, how was this information created? How was it handled? Were there any deviations from normal processes and why? And so forth. And so we, we may need to have backup testimony for uh, any of this documentary evidence. Um, anyway. Now, uh, there are rules of evidence and um, there are different rules of evidence in ju different jurisdictions. So this is not a hard and fast list, but uh, most cases in, in terms of rules of evidence um, follow this, this type of pattern. First of all, the evidence has to be relevant. As I said, you know, we deal with computers. We think we deal with real evidence. No, the fact that it's a computer is irrelevant. It's the information that's contained on the computer or was contained on the computer or was obtained from the computer that's what's important. The fact that this is a computer is irrelevant, so that computer is not admissible as evidence. Uh, in terms of admissibility, there's uh, the reliability of this information, and particularly what is known as the chain of evidence or the chain of custody. Who obtained this information? How did they hold it? How do they protect it from any tampering while it was in their custody. Um, uh, so when we seize a hard drive, uh, we will take the hard drive from the computer. We will make a bit image copy and, and we will not make a backup of it. A bit image copy is different from a backup. If um, we use normal backup software, the normal backup software will flip the archive bit on every file on the disk. Uh, that is that is standard practice and, and that uh, not only does it does it sort of tamper with the evidence, but it actually eliminates an awful lot of evidence that we could have had uh, from that hard disk if we had left it alone. So a bit image copy is something that does not do any writing to that disk. It just reads the evidence off it. We make a bit image copy. We seal up the original hard disk. Then we take that bit image copy that we have made and we make another copy of it. And that becomes our working copy. So that if anything goes wrong when we are working with our working copy, all we need to do is go back to our original bit image copy and make another copy of that and, and work away on that. We don't have to unseal that hard drive, which is after all real evidence in a sense, in order to do that. So, so you know, there's less messing with the, the evidence uh, by doing it that way. There is also the legality. Um, are you allowed to do this type of search? Are you allowed to do this type of seizure? And uh, this, uh, this gets into very interesting places. Um, if you seize evidence illegally, then any lines of investigation that resulted from that illegally seized evidence are themselves illegal and may not be admissible. And, and we just had a case um, 
here in NBC uh, where uh, somebody killed someone. And uh, basically, they, they found the evidence that indicates that, yes, uh, you know, this person did it. But the thing is that they did not properly seize that evidence. Uh, I believe it was a phone. And uh, uh, kept it improperly without uh, going back to the court and, uh, and verifying that they had permission to, to keep that. And because of that, all the remaining evidence that came out of that was tainted. And unfortunately, that guy goes free. But, you know, that is, is the law. If you mess with the evidence, you lose the case. And uh, one of the, the final rules is that it always has to be the best evidence. Uh, demonstrative evidence will do when you don't have documentary evidence. Documentary evidence will do when you don't have real evidence. Real evidence will do when you don't have direct testimony. But if you happen to have direct testimony, you know, you're not allowed to present other lesser evidence. Um, unless, of course, we've got, uh, you know, contradictions and, and other reasons uh, for uh, presenting evidence that is not the best. Um, monitoring and surveillance and, and privacy issues um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, presenting stuff in court again, keep that to a minimum. Make sure you have agreements and, and permissions. Um, very interesting case in the United States in, in Oregon, uh, not too far from here. Uh, police station, uh, somebody was fired for having conjugal relations uh, on police property. Um, and sued for wrongful dismissal, came back into court. Uh, the police came in with a videotape because, of course, you know, this is a police station. There's all kinds of video all over everywhere and signs up saying, you know, uh, video surveillance. And it's not just for bureau protection. It can be used in court, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the guy's lawyer said, what's that? And they said, that's the evidence. They said, nope, you can't bring that into court because the alleged activity took place in a broom closet and nobody in their right mind would put a video camera in a broom closet and therefore my client had a reasonable expectation of privacy. <coughs> now I don't know how that was actually decided in the end and I really would love to know but even the fact that the uh, argument was made that way indicates that this can be a very thorny issue. It can be a, a problem, yeah, that kind of stuff. So privacy is, is a major issue. It's now a specialty on its own. Uh, of course, we have the privacy directives. We have the various laws here in Canada. Uh, U.S. Safe Harbor, that was really, really interesting. Um, that has been struck down twice, and now they're trying again with something similar called uh, something, uh, a new name to it. I guess they're hoping the new name will kind of fool people. I doubt that it is fooling people, and I suspect that it's going to be challenging the European courts once again. And, uh, of course, GDPR is really based on the privacy directives with the simple addition of, of the accounting uh, accountability uh, rules in there. And most of the accountability stuff is, is simply things that you should be doing uh, to protect your systems anyway. So uh, GDPR is not the, the bugbear that people make it out to be. Now, as I say, there is another side. It's this adversarial system and, and the people on the other side, um, they, um, want to know what you are doing and uh, over time the courts have decided that they get to see everything you got. So this is, is very interesting in terms of decisions in regard to uh, how much data uh, companies are going to keep. And many companies that had been keeping absolutely everything, I mean act for all storage is cheap, have decided that with the risk of having to 
produce masses and masses of data that uh, maybe they will keep what they keep to a minimum. Um, and an interesting uh, uh, set of business decisions there in regard to that. Uh, now, as I say, um, when uh, in, in terms of the chain of custody, digital evidence, uh, digital information is very fragile. And any change you make to it, well, if you change it, no way to say what was changed by whom, uh, what the original data was, whether it was important, if it was changed, your evidence is worthless. And this worked to my advantage one time. Um, I uh, had rented a car to go and teach down in, in Tacoma. And, and when I got back, uh, the car rental company claimed that there was a dent um, that hadn't been there when I rented the car. And I had kept the, you know, I'd done the walk around and I had marked up uh, indications on the, the sheet um, and I had my copy. And, you know, they, they uh, kept insisting that no, uh, in that particular place, uh, there was only a scratch originally and now there was a dent. And so the dent was my fault and they were gonna be charging me. And uh, I, th there were several uh, phone calls, uh, their people harassing me, uh, trying to get me to pay this and I wouldn't. And the final one, uh, the final call from somebody, uh, he said, well, look, you know, here on my record of it, it clearly says scratch. And I said, what? He said, it says right here on the form, scratch. I says on my form, which is the second copy, there's just a tick mark. And he hung up and I never heard from them again because of course he knew that I I could prove by you know having a copy of that that they had changed their copy of the document. And if changed, your evidence is worthless. The chain of custody has been broken. It's it's no good anymore. So you know, I I did not have to pay. When you are a uh, a witness presenting in court, um, you are generally speaking a witness of fact. You are saying what you saw, what you what you heard, what you knew. Um, you can't give an opinion. An expert witness is allowed to present an opinion what you thought, what you decided, what you, an expert witness um, is different in different jurisdictions and uh, even in a, a common law uh, uh, system, uh, this is different. In the United States, uh, something called the Dover decision, the judge decides whether you have the skill and the training and the experience to be an expert witness. And interestingly, in the United States, because of that opinion, the question of bias is unimportant. Bias is irrelevant. Uh, you can be completely biased, but if you have the skill and the training and the experience to be an expert witness, you can be an expert witness. The, the judge can accept your opinion. In the UK, uh, the, uh, the UK courts will not allow any possible bias. So uh, a friend of mine who um, was with the high tech crimes unit in the UK, um, simply because he was with the police, uh, he was not allowed to be an expert witness because it was assumed he would automatically have a bias, even though he had considerable skill and training and experience in that field. Um, you know, very, very expert guy, but he could not be an expert witness in the UK. Uh, here in Canada, our uh, system tends to fall in between there. Um, the uh, Canadian courts definitely don't like bias, but uh, sometimes they will decide that the skill training and experience uh, may overcome the possibility of, of bias in that regard. So, 
presentation of your evidence. Um, there's an awful lot of preparation involved in this, and, and really this is going to take hours and hours and hours. You may be uh, called upon to testify for, you know, five minutes in court, and yet you will be grilled for hours and hours and hours. Uh, well in advance, there will be a discovery where the opposite side gets to grill you and interview you for hours and hours and hours. Again, even, you know, even though it may be five minutes uh, worth of, of stuff. Um, the, uh, but, you know, your own side, the side that is, is hiring you as, as a witness, um, they're going to be sitting you down with a lawyer for a couple of hours and then sitting you down with another lawyer for another couple of hours and then sitting you down with another lawyer for a couple of hours and then back to the original lawyer for a couple of hours and over and over and over again pre preparing for this five minute uh, uh, presentation in, in court. Um, and that's because um, lawyers, again, have a, a mantra that you never ask a question you don't know the answer to. And I've, you know, as as a technical person, I have found this extremely uh, wearying. And in one particular case, I had been through hours and hours and hours and hours, dozens of hours of preparation and interviews with different lawyers and one of them was going at it again with me and he was asking questions and because he was not a technical person his questions made no sense and so he'd he'd ask a question and i'd answer slightly differently depending on how he worded his question and i'm sure that he found it frustrating and i was finding it frustrating and i finally said to him look why, you know, what is it that you want me to say? And he said, I can't tell you. I said, why not? He said, because that would be leading the witness. Which, of course, is illegal. But they they do this kind of preparation. Um, and you have to remember your audience. Uh, do remember that you, you are presenting in court to two lawyers who you know were definitely intelligent enough to get through law school and it's not easy but uh they are not necessarily techies so they do not necessarily understand what they're asking questions about and a judge who is by definition an old lawyer and 12 people who, you will remember, were too stupid to get out of jury duty. And, you know, this is, uh, this is the audience. This is who you are uh, talking to. And so, you know, make sure that you keep things as, as clear and as simple and as accurate as, as you possibly can. And again, there is this issue of, of relevance. Um, uh, again, a uh, court case I was involved with, uh, I have been involved in, in far too many lawsuits uh, to do with intellectual property and, and patent trolls, and I really hate patent trolls. Uh, so in the UK, I will definitely never be an expert witness in uh, an intellectual property case, um, but in the United States, I could be. Uh, anyways, the... Uh, I knew that I had, I, in this case, I wasn't an expert witness. I was an, a witness of fact. I was providing uh, just the prior art. I had a copy of a program which was prior art. As a matter of fact, I had a number of copies of different programs that I all considered to be prior art uh, and uh, that I figured, you know, could sort of overwhelm uh, uh, the the case with with evidence, but no, um, that's sort of not not allowed. That's not relevant uh, necessarily to the case and and the way that uh, court cases are decided. And the uh, 
I, I again ask, you know, look, I, you know, I've got this, I've got that, and I've got the other thing, you know, that I think addresses this particular patent that we you want to invalidate. And they said, no, we have to we have to present the best. We only have a limited amount of time, so it has to be very strictly relevant. And and we can't bring in extra additional extraneous evidence. And as I say, CSI. Um, the uh, the television shows, um, the expectations on the part of the public that you can uh, present evidence in an entertaining fashion with computer animations and bells and whistles that clearly shows that it has to have been this way and no other way and, and you know, everything is very easy to decide. Uh, you know, that has a lot to answer for because that is the expectation uh, that the the general public and the general public is what makes up juries uh, have now in terms of presenting technical evidence in court. And that makes life difficult for the rest of us who live in the real world. So there we are with regard to presenting technical evidence in court. So, any questions? Comments? Legal challenges? Any hard time that you, did you face in court? Okay. Do Sorry. You experience, do you have any experience to share, uh, for example, any hard time that you encountered in, in court? I just did. I know. Any more stories? Well, I, I will tell you one. Um, a court case, uh, again, intellectual property patent troll case, and uh, I, uh, <laughs> uh, again, there was all this preparation. There was there was a six hour discovery session that had been done six months in advance. Uh, there was all kinds of preparation with the lawyers and and ta da 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 da. And I, once again, I was a witness of fact in this one, not a not a an expert witness. Um, and so, as an and a witness of fact, I was not allowed to be in the court. The expert witnesses again, because they are assumed uh, that their um, uh, any any bias is irrelevant. Uh, then. Uh, it, uh, they could be in the court. So, uh, and I knew all of the, the guys who were expert witnesses in this court, you know, uh, uh, in this case. Um, I uh, uh, never actually met any of them face to face, but I'd, I'd known and worked with them for years and years online, of course. And uh, so they were all, they were all in, in the court listening to the, the court case going on. And I, on the day that I was to come in and, and do the presentation, uh, had to be kept in a little ante room out of the court, you know, didn't get to hear any testimony, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the guys, one of the, the experts, um, came back into the room where I was and he was chuckling. And I had been waiting uh, like, I think seven or eight days uh, for me to be called. And he uh, was chuckling and he came in and he said, you're not going to testify. And I kind of looked at him, you know, after all this time, I'm not going to testify. And uh, apparently what had happened was that the lawyer on my side, uh, the, the lawyer, a lawyer from the law firm that had hired me as a witness, uh, had made a mistake, one mistake, in the discovery session. There was some advice that he had given me as to whether or not I could answer something. 
And that was, in fact, wrong. And this was so bizarre because it was, in fact, the other side who had insisted that I be brought to this trial and, and ready to be presented. And just before uh, I was to be called to testify, the, the other side, the, you know, the, the patent troll guys stood up in court and said, he can't be called to testify because of this error that was made six months ago in discovery. And the judge was absolutely livid. And I, you know, <laughs> I was fairly upset all this time and trouble and, and effort and flying across the country and, and so forth. And uh, it didn't really matter anyways. Uh, the, the team that hired me won anyways. Uh, my evidence was allowed to go, and of course the expert witnesses had all, you know, given their testimony what, what my evidence meant, uh, and, and that side won. And, you know, all, but all of this had been done simply as, as an annoyance and expense to the side that had hired me uh, because they knew that, and had known for six months that they were going to object when it came time to call me into court. So there's a there's a story for you from a court case. How's, how's that? It, how's it? Does lawyer did <laughs> really do a silly job? Yeah. Like I say, they are a different species. Yes. Awesome presentation, Rob. Thank you. Even the encore is a good story. <laughs> it's great to have so many of your students here, too. Hey, thank yes. you, Rob. But it, it, I think it was a great presentation. Thank you very much. OK, good. Glad you enjoyed it. Hope very it was interesting. interesting. Yeah. So next one is June 1st for the NFT.